He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Let me just add my thanks to Leah. I, we miss having you here. That was fantastic. I was mesmerized watching your fingers fly across the keys. You, God's given you a great gift, and thanks for sharing that gift with us. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father God, now as we come to the end of this series in Colossians, this remarkable ancient letter, which not only reveals Paul's heart for that church, but your heart for us, your church today, we ask you to speak to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is the living word made flesh. Amen. We're in the final week of our series uh, on Colossians called All Things, where you heard the verse in the little video there. It's our memory, scripture memory verse for the series. Hopefully you've been working at that. I won't make you do it publicly here. Uh, but Colossians 1, 15 to 17, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He, all things are created through him, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Perhaps you've memorized that or been listening to it, uh, letting that get into your heart. And Paul's talking to this church who he's never visited. He's only heard about them through a man named Epaphras, who likely Paul had led to Christ. And he, Epaphras apparently is from Colossae and has planted that church and is telling Paul about these Christians, this house church. And Colossae is a small, out-of-the-way city. It's not as important as Laodicea, which is just down the road, a bigger, more economically vibrant city. But Paul writes to them, the church he's never visited. And the central message of his letter is, everything hinges on Jesus. All things. In your life, in this world, in the church, it all comes down to being crystal clear and laser focused on who Jesus is. And everything flows out of that. And we've talked, Paul goes on to talk about how you live in your family, how you live in the world, how you understand your place, your identity, what the gospel story is. All of it hinges on the identity and power and supremacy of Christ. So we're going to now wrap this up in chapter 4. And as we come to chapter 4, I, you know, I, I was thinking about an illustration. What Paul, as he does in many places, sort of has some summary statements and some final instructions. And I think you can tell a lot about a person by the way that they pack for a trip. You think that's true? People are different when it comes to this. My wife and I are different when it comes to packing for a trip. How many of you are, uh, when you pack for a trip, it's a, it's a multiple day process? Anybody? I mean, you think about it, you've got lists, you lay it out, you pack, and then repack, and unpack, and repack, and double check, and triple check, and check it off the list, and go through that. Anybody like that? Okay, how many of you do it the proper way, and you just throw stuff in the bag the night before? Okay? <laughs> that's how I do it. I won't tell you how my wife does it, right? And so... <laughs> And so it, and the fact that I pack in a hurry stresses her out terribly. How can you be sure you have everything? Ah, you know, if I forgot something, I'll just buy it when we get there. So then what happens when we get in the car and we're driving to the airport is, what? You know what happens. Did you bring this? Did you bring, like, which is the exact wrong time to ask those questions. Like, we're on the way over here, right? Did you bring it? Did you bring it? Did you bring it? You know? However, in fairness to my wife, we get on the plane, and she pulls out all the things she remembered to bring like mints and gum and snacks, and I want some of that. And she's looking at me like, really? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Throw it in the bag last minute. I'm really supposed to give you what I packed. She shares with me, but she just gives me that look. The, and, and by the way, this is not part of the sermon, but I just have to ask this question. Like, I don't understand why there are suitcase stores in the airport. <laughs> is that something people forget? Or people walking in with like all their stuff going, what did I forget? Oh, my bag. <laughs> oh, there's the store. I could buy one right there. Anyway, okay. There are some things you don't want to forget. There are some, some things you don't like, like your passport, your ID, your phone, your charger, of course. And as we come to the end of Colossians, Paul's not summarizing the whole letter, but he's, he's giving some instructions to the church in Colossae and to us, some things that he wants to be sure you don't forget. Like in light of who Jesus is, don't forget these things. These are really, really important. I think he's, you, you might call it a kind of a spiritual packing list for our lives. So let's open to Colossians chapter 4. We're only going to read verses 2 through 6, but that will be more than enough to get through here. 
Colossians 4, beginning with verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As I said, Paul's not summarizing the whole letter here, but he is giving a kind of a so what summary for if Jesus is the preeminent one, if all things hold together in him, then you must be focused on these things. You must not forget these things. What does he list first? What's the first thing Paul says for his final instructions here? Prayer. Be a praying church. If Jesus is the firstborn, if everything holds together in him, then continue to seek him in prayer. Be a collection of people devoted to prayer. This is central to what it means to be a church. And a praying church is not just a church that has prayer in its services or has prayer services. Both of those things are true. We hope you come back tonight for a prayer service. But a praying church is praying people gathered together. That you and me, that we're devoted to prayer. That we continue steadfastly in prayer, individually and collectively. Now, I pray. I pray regularly. But I think God has some work to do in my heart in prayer. I think I have growing to do in prayer. How many of you would say, no, I'm pretty much perfect in prayer? <laughs> I didn't think so. How many of you would say, I, I want to grow in prayer. I want to be a more prayerful person. I do too. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. You know what the best way to learn to be more prayerful is? Pray. Pray. Well, I don't know the right words. I'm not sure. God's not grading your grammar. He's not evaluating your theology. Just pray. Speak to your Father, who's always speaking to you. Paul says, in light of all of this, be a praying church. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Not pray when you feel like it. Not pray when the mood strikes you. Not pray occasionally. But pray continually, steadfastly. Some of you will know 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. When I was a kid, I thought that meant, like, that's, that's dangerous. If your eyes are closed, walking around, praying without ceasing, you're going to bump into stuff. Because I thought prayer had to be like this all the time, right? What, are you walking on your knees? How do you pray without ceasing? It doesn't, the word doesn't, in Greek doesn't mean, like, you never, ever stop. It means a continual returning to prayer. A continual recurrence of. Years ago, Pastor Brian and, and, and Pastor Bruce and I and a couple others, we, we would take uh, in the late summer, early fall, a, a retreat to pray and to plan for the ministry year ahead. And usually we'd go up to like Lake Geneva at some resort or we'd stay somewhere overnight and we'd have some time together. To, we'd spend our days in planning and prayer. And this time uh, Brian said, hey Jeff, why don't you pick the place that we go and stay? I said, okay. And I had been doing some reading about Benedictine and monastic spirituality. And so I looked up online this, this, this monastery in, uh, in Paosta, Iowa called the New Melloray Benedictine Monastery. I thought, let's go there. And Brian was like, oh, okay. And so we did. <laughs> we went to this monastery. And it was, it was interesting. The, the brothers let you stay there, and you can eat there, and you, you can have some, some time of silence and some prayer, and you can join them for the praying of the hours if you like. Uh, if you, some of you might know this. If you grew up Catholic or you studied this, they have seven hours of prayer throughout the day. One of them is at 2 a.m. called uh, uh, Matins or Vigil. And I was trying to convince Pastor Brian and Pastor Bruce to join me for Vigil, prayer at 2 a.m. Pastor Bruce didn't want to do that. But Brian did, and so we joined the monks here. Uh, this is an image of the chancel that, that, where they pray, and the, the brothers would pray, and they just chant psalms and prayers back and forth across at each other. And so we got there at 2 a.m. This is not a picture I took. It's from the, the Internet. But uh, I didn't want to take a picture in the prayer service. I thought that would be rude. But we got there at 2 a.m., and they were holding vigil over one of the brothers who had passed away. So Pastor Brian and I are there. What, there's a dead monk in a casket, and these guys praying over him. It was a little creepy, but also powerful. And I talked to one of the brothers the next morning, and he said, well, we believe that our work in the world, our service to the world, is our prayers. The way that we serve the world is by being, is praying for it. And I think that's powerful. It stayed with me. It marked me. Now, I think there's more that God has for the church than just hiding away and praying. 
God has an, a, a greater mission for us. But sometimes in contemporary evangelicalism, particularly in America, I think we've forgotten that too is part of our mission. That too is part of our work, is to be a praying church, to continue steadfastly in prayer. Prayer is not just the beginning and end of a Christian meeting. It's not the last resort. It's the first response. Paul's very clear about this. As a matter of fact, the book of Colossians begins with prayer. You might remember that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. This is Paul's great prayer for the Colossians. We talked about this a few weeks ago. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We talked about those verses that follow and how that's Paul's great prayer for them and God's prayer for us, and we can pray that for each other. So Paul begins by saying, I've not stopped praying for you, and then he ends the letter by saying, now you don't stop praying. And he also invites them to pray for him, which is remarkable. Think about that. This little out-of-the-way house church in kind of a nothing town. Paul says, pray for me. What must it have felt like to hear the apostle Paul wants us to pray for him? And there's these two words at the end of verse 2. Be watchful and thankful. Now I get steadfast and continuing, and I get thankfulness in prayer. What does it mean to be watchful in prayer? Does it mean you can pray with your eyes open? What does it mean to be watchful in prayer? Well, yes, by the way, you can. The word literally means to keep awake, to stay alert. What was it Jesus said to his disciples in Gethsemane? Stay here while I go a, few, a distance away, and when you stay here, watch and pray. And what did they do? <laughs> they, they didn't watch and pray. They fell asleep. But it doesn't just mean physically awake. One time, I've shared this before, my wife and I, when we were first married, would pray at night in bed before we, we as a, kind of a thing to do together is before we fell asleep. And, and I, we were praying, and I was laying in bed, and I, we would go back and forth, pray for the kids, pray for our lives, and, and it would take turns. And all I remember is that she was praying, and now it was silent. And I'm laying on my back in bed. And I'm not sure, did I fall asleep? And if I did, has it been two seconds or two minutes? I don't know. And so I went, uh, Lord, and she went, don't even bother. <laughs> so apparently it had been more than two seconds. It doesn't just mean stay physically awake in your prayer. It means stay spiritually awake. Awake to the work of God in the world. Being watchful means paying attention to what's going on in your life, on your street, in your community, in the world. And prayerful. Now, there are watchful people who are watching the news and watching what's going on, but they're not prayerful and thankful. They become cynical and fearful. That's not the posture of the church. You watch the impeachment hearings or election stuff, and, and you can be watchful, but it can also produce a fear and a cynicism and an angst in you. Paul says be watchful and thankful because we're prayerful. So we watch what God's doing in the world, and we thank him that he's still on the throne despite how it might look in the moment. We praise him. We just sang it, right? Give thanks for what the Lord has done for us. Paul is saying for us to be watchful, pay attention. Frederick Beatner said we should pray with the Bible in one hand and the daily news in the other. Not just going through the motions. Thankfulness is a major theme of Paul in this letter. He's always telling us to be thankful and do these things with gratitude. And it should be a major theme of our lives. In verse 3, Paul says to the Colossian church, pray for us, for him and those with him. Specifically, that God may open a door. Let me read verse 3 to you and see if anything strikes you as a little interesting or odd or ironic. Verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Strike you as interesting? What's Paul's prayer request? Specifically, open a door. What door? Where is Paul when he writes this letter? In prison. But he doesn't pray for this prison door. I think I would. I think if I were Paul, I'd be like, let's start with this door, Lord. How about the cell door? How about open this door for me? Paul doesn't pray that. He says, pray for me and for us that God will open a door for the gospel, which, by the way, is the reason I'm in prison. I've been preaching the gospel, and it ended me up in chains and in jail. But don't worry about my circumstances. Pray for more open doors for the gospel. This is remarkable. 
and humbling. When I talk to people like Amanda or serve the world partners that we have around the world or missionaries, and some of you know this, Art and Dorothy Helwig were here a couple of weeks ago and talking with them. Their prayer requests are very seldom for their own circumstances. It's pray that this connection is made with this government official. Pray this relationship goes through. Pray we get this permit. Pray this, this opportunity happens because that will give us a chance to reach more people, to serve more people, to preach the gospel. Paul's prayer is not about his circumstances, which are dire at the moment, but about opportunities for the gospel, open doors for the gospel. And he says to the Colossians, pray for me, for us, that God would open more doors, make more connections, give more opportunities for us to share the love of God. That's his mission, and it's ours as well. Now, it's not wrong to pray for your circumstances. It's not wrong to pray for God to get you out of certain situations. Or That's not wrong at all. I just think it's interesting that's not Paul's primary prayer request. If I'm honest, I think one of the ways God wants to grow my heart in prayer is that my prayer life is mostly about me and mine. My kids, my wife, my circumstances. And again, that's not wrong. God cares about those things. But I think he wants to enlarge my vision, maybe yours as well. And say, fine, I care about those things, but let let me tell you what I'm doing in the world. Be watchful, be thankful that I'm a God who's bigger than your circumstances. There's a lot more going on. And this is what Paul is asking them to pray for. Paul asked them in verse 4 to pray for his clarity in communication of the gospel. This is interesting to me. Pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Paul The great theologian of the New Testament, the writer of three quarters of the New Testament, asked the Colossian church that he would be clear. That's interesting, isn't it? Would Paul be unclear? And I was thinking about this for our lives. In what ways are we unclear with the gospel? Well, have you ever shied away from something you know God's word teaches because you're afraid it might offend somebody? I have. I don't want to go there because I know what they'll think. Have you ever... You know, you know there, there is good news. God does love and forgive. But there's also a message of repentance. Repent of your sin. When you preach repentance or talk about repentance, most people are not like, oh, I so love that. Right? There, it's a little, it's got an edge to it. And sometimes we're tempted to maybe just avoid that part or soft sell it or maybe just leave this part out or just talk about, you know, God's indiscriminate love. Paul says, help me to make it clear. Not harsh, but clear, as I ought to speak. We have a message. This leads us to being a proclaiming church. Being a prayerful church should lead us to be a proclaiming church. We have a message to share, to proclaim in the world. Paul says, pray for me so that I'm clear about it, so people get it. Our purpose is not just to hide away and pray for the world like the monks, but to be present in it and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in it. Perhaps you've heard this quote. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Anybody heard that before? Anybody know where it comes from? St. Francis of Assisi? It's almost always attributed to him, but here's an interesting tidbit. It's very uncertain whether he actually ever said that or wrote that. Do a little Google searching. Anyway, what he did write is, I think, even more important uh, and more helpful to us. In his rule of, of, for the... For the Franciscan monks, he writes, all the friars should preach not just with their words, but with their deeds. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is also our preaching. Francis was preaching all the time about the love of God. The problem I have with that quote that's attributed to him, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary use words, is that it's always necessary to use words. You cannot preach the gospel without words. You can communicate some things non-verbally, can't you? Husbands and wives that are in here together right now, this morning, you can look at each other and communicate certain things without words, can't you? I can look at my wife, she can look at me, and by a look I can know what she's thinking. But there are some things that even between the closest of human relationships, we have to have words. If I wanted you to know that I really like you, I could give you that indication. If I disapproved of you, right? But what if I wanted you to know to meet me in the parking lot at 1230 today and follow me in your car to Chili's? How could I do that without words? (laughs) 
You can't, like, th there's limits, right? How do you, you could, there are some things you can communicate non-verbally about God. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Night after night they pour forth speech. But they only bring you so far. If you want someone to know that God entered this world as a human baby, lived a sinless life, died on a Roman cross, was raised and there was an empty tomb, and ascended into heaven, and now is coming back to judge the world in righteousness, that's hard to say without words. The gospel cannot be preached without words. What Francis is saying, and what Paul is saying, remember Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give you thanks to God the Father through him. He's saying our life must match up with our message. There can't be a disconnect, or it damages the proclaiming we have to do. But it's a mistake to think that, well, we can just love people and hope they figure it out. Hope they find their way to God because we're nice and kind. It's not enough. We are to be a proclaiming church. Paul says, we are, he says, to declare the mystery of Christ. To make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Let your speech be always gracious. There's speaking involved. There's sharing involved. And it doesn't just mean the pastor on the Sunday in the sermon. It means our lives, opportunities. What are, what, praying for open doors. What's good is that if we're not willing to walk through them? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Apostle Paul makes this, I think, he puts this beautifully, our mission and our message. One of my favorite things he's written in the New Testament, verses 18 through 20. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What a passage. He's entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. He's making his appeal through our lives and through our words. We're ambassadors. What good would an ambassador be to a foreign country, the United States, if they never spoke, right? They, they represent the one that sent them. They speak on behalf of. This brings us finally to the third part of this little verse, be a present church. Be a praying church, be a proclaiming church, and be a present church. In verse 5, Paul says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. This is really, a, what a great little statement. Walk in wisdom toward those who are not part of the family of God yet. Make the best use of the time. The Greek literally means to buy back or to rec reclaim, redeem the time. Because it's limited time that we have. Walk in wisdom. In other words, we're not proclaiming from a distance. We're not standing at a safe distance saying, repent, you're bad, <laughs> right? We're present among, present in the world. Our, our prayers and our proclamation are done in proximity, closeness, shared life with. But this takes wisdom to walk in the world. You can't do it. It's not a cookie-cutter approach. It's not cut and paste for every situation. People will come to me sometimes and say, Pastor, I've got a friend who has these questions. And they're not a believer at work or in school or wherever in my neighborhood. They, and they're challenged. They, they ask this, and what should I say? And they want me to give them like the, the ammunition for the gun, right? The spiritual bullets. Just say this. Pow, 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 pow. Then they'll become a Christian, right? It doesn't work like that. I, a young man who, uh, who was uh, in my youth group, our youth ministry years ago when I was youth pastor here, was, loved to argue and was really smart and apologetics and well-read. And he was so distraught that he could, his friends were not coming to faith in Jesus. He's like, I, I don't understand. They know they're wrong. They know I'm right. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem, right? I never met anybody yet who was argued into heaven. Fine, you win, you're smarter than me, I'll become a Christian. That's not how it works. Our goal is not to win arguments, but to welcome wanderers and introduce them to Jesus. And that takes wisdom, because every situation is unique and different. Every person's different. Jesus says a couple of things in the Gospels that are, if you put them together, how does that work? He says, Let your, your people in the world will see your good deeds and praise your Father who's in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. 
that they may see your good deeds and praise God. And then he says, if the world hates you because of the way you live, remember it hated me first. Well, which is it, Jesus? Are they going to love God and praise him because of our lives? Or are they going to hate us because we represent you? And Jesus says, yes. Yes, actually. And it takes wisdom to know when to say what? When to say nothing. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Sometimes people don't need you to argue with them or answer every question. They need you just to show up and be present with them, to listen to them, to hear their story, to pray for them. Sometimes people need a direct challenge and a confrontation. Sometimes they need a listening ear. Sometimes they need something in between, a word of encouragement. So that takes wisdom and discernment to know. And then Paul says in verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Again, there, the nuance of each person. Gracious speech, not combative or argumentative speech, not fearful speech. I, my observation of the world in which we're living right now, this mo- cultural moment for Christianity and the church, is that too many of us take a posture of combativeness, defensiveness, and fearfulness, myself included. And I know, I know that there are reasons to fear. I know that there's legitimate concerns about religious freedoms being compromised. I I understand all of that. But that's not the posture of the church in the world. Do you think it was different for the Colossians? Do you think that it was just easy and smooth sailing? They're entering into a season of unprecedented persecution in the Roman Empire. Paul says, let your speech always be gracious. Not fearful, not combative, not argumentative, but gracious. Why? Because you know who's in control. You know who you belong to. You know who holds all things together. And it isn't the government. And it isn't the Democrats or the Republicans. And it isn't the judicial system. And it isn't the economy. It's Jesus. And he's yours and you're his. So let your speech be gracious. Seasoned with salt, he says. What does that mean? We think of salt as a flavor. It's also a preservative in the ancient world, a very important preservative. It doesn't just mean sprinkling in Jesus' talk now and then. It means, yeah, (laughs) Jesus-y is a word. It means when we talk to people, there, there ought to be some invitation, some grace that makes people, like, I, I, People would say, I know I don't know if I believe that, but I but they're so kind, they're so gracious, they're interesting. I want to know more. Not just shooting them down. Ephesians 4:29, Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits each occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So Paul says, be a praying church, be a proclaiming church. That's not afraid to declare the glories of God and the mystery of the gospel. And be a present church. Be present in the world. That that gives context to your prayer and your proclamation. Because you're right next door to people, with them. In fact, let me just read how the the letter ends. And I wish we had more time to go into this, but I think it's important to make a couple of observations. I'm going to read verses 7 through the end end of Colossians. Final greetings here. Tychicus which is fun to say, will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus. Do you know who Onesimus is? If you read the book of Philemon, Philemon was a man that Paul's writing to, was a slave owner. His slave, his runaway slave's name, Onesimus. Onesimus is a runaway slave, and Paul says, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. You know who Mark is? Go read Acts 15. There'll be a man named John Mark listed there. This is... uh, 
Paul and Barnabas split up, had a sharp disagreement, and couldn't work together over this guy. Apparently this Mark, John Mark, at one point early in Paul's ministry, uh, bailed out on a missionary journey. I don't know if he was hungry, it was too hard, there were too many mosquitoes, what the reason was, but he didn't want to go, and he bailed out, and Paul held that against him. And later on, when Barnabas in Acts 15 says, I want to bring Mark, Paul says, no way, you don't bring that guy, he quit on us. He's a quitter. This is my translation, right? I'm bringing him. No, you're not. I'm bringing him. No, you're not. They had this fight. And they split up over it. They didn't go together. Now, here at the end of Paul's life, he's in prison. He's saying, Mark's a beloved brother. Mark's one of us too. You've got a runaway slave and somebody who was a deserter now reconciled back and he goes on. And Jesus was called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision, meaning Jews, and my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Nympha is mentioned as the homeowner and one of the church leaders of the church in Laodicea. Now, Laodicea is the wealthier, bigger, more important city from Colossae, just down the road, a few miles away. Paul says, go greet her as well. You've got a runaway slave, a deserter, and a woman mentioned here by name. Talk about being present means be personally present with real people in real life who have real names. And he goes on. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. See that also you read the letter from Laodicea. That's that's really interesting, isn't it? It tells you how the New Testament was spread. These letters. He says, Paul's saying, read this letter out loud in the congregation. And when you do, take it over to Laodicea and have it read there. And by the way, have their letter read in your church. This is what was going on in the first century. You wonder how the New Testament got put together? This is part of the story. They're reading these letters of encouragement to each other, circulating them. Okay, we have to wrap up. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. To be a present church means that we show up personally with real people, with real stories, who have names, even names that come down to us through the centuries. It's tempting for us to think the needs are so great in the world, what difference can we really make? Paul tells you, you can be present with people, you can proclaim the good news of Jesus to people, you can pray. That's your work. That's our work. Remember we said at the outset of this this series that Paul's heart for the Colossians is God's heart for us, his church today. Be a praying church. Let's be a praying church. Let's be a proclaiming church. Joyful but unashamed. Let's be a present church in the world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this ancient letter which is so relevant for us. Thank you for revealing your heart for us as your people in the world. We thank you that you did not stand far off and shout instructions, but you came to be present among us, to demonstrate for us the life that we're meant to live, to pay the penalty for the life we have lived in sin, to liberate us from the consequences by rising from the grave, and to give us hope for all eternity by ascending to heaven and promising to return. God, you've placed us here in this time as individuals and as a church family that we might be prayerful and proclaiming your good news and present in the world. We ask you for your spirit to help and guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.